we are back for another brilliant year of the SMK campaigners and we're here for 2022. So excited that you could join us. I'm Viv Groskop. I'm hosting this amazing award ceremony for the sixth year running, one of the proudest accolade, uh, accolades of my life. Always love these awards. Uh, so heartwarming in a cold, cold world. world. SMK always brings the warmth. This is our third year of being virtual and this year we're coming from the newsroom of our media partners Tortoise with a real live audience. Feel the buzz. Uh, I think we're all going to enjoy ourselves tonight. We're going to be here for around an hour finishing just after 5pm so please stick with us uh, if you're watching online. Not only happening here in the room and on screen but also, also on social media. Please continue that conversation there if you can. Share your love for our brilliant winners and runners up tonight using the hashtags love campaigning, SMK Awards 2022 and interacting with at SMK campaigners on Twitter. I've also got a little extra help tonight when the winners are announced. The voice you'll hear is Rashid Nix and he has got an absolutely gorgeous voice. Rashid is a youth mentor, educator, journalist, social commentator and a force for change in his own right. So a big thank you to him for being part of all this. I'd also like to say a massive thank you to our sponsors whose generosity makes tonight possible, of course. Uh, all the branding and design you can see is done pro bono by the talented brand ethos. The team at our production company Voitech have brought all of their creativity and expertise and an extra big thank you to Tortoise of course for hosting us and to all of their team for helping us to bring the 2022 awards alive in a special new way. Of course the inspiration and joy supplied here tonight really comes from all of the amazing campaigners we will be celebrating. So first to mark that and their importance, let's hear first from Sue Tibbles, Chief Executive of the Sheila McKechnie Foundation, and Dave Taylor, one of the editors at Tortoise. Thank you, Viv, and a very, very warm welcome to all of you out there and all of you in here. It is so nice, so nice to be back in person again. Um, it's three years since we were back in the same room, so it's just wonderful. And we are so delighted to be partnering with you at Tortoise. Your slow news philosophy feels absolutely right in these fast, frenetic times. And each year, I always say something about the times we're in and how difficult they are, and each year it fe feels even more important to just acknowledge that, whether it is still COVID, cost of living crisis, climate, Ukraine. These things are being felt all around the world. We are taking inspiration from campaigners all around the world. And we hope that some of them might tune in to us today and that we can share some inspiration with them. We at the Sheila McKechnie Foundation still take inspiration from Sheila herself, who was an amazing campaigner working on housing and homelessness, consumer rights, health and safety. She showed how campaigners can build their power and wield power to make change, often against the odds, as many of you, our winners today, have also done. Um, and Sheila's mother used to say that Sheila was fizzing with injustice. And she herself said that she was a fully paid up member of the Awkward Squad. Yay! Um, so yeah, we hope that we're still honoring Sheila's spirit today. Campaigning itself is something that is at times very quiet, in fact, as we try and listen, understand what's going on, build relationships with people. Campaigning is in large part about persuasion and making friends. And other times it is about being loud. It is about speaking up and out. It is about disruption and making waves that can disturb the status quo. We at SMK seek to support all campaigners, um, from people working in very big organisations to people that are working on their own. And I know that amongst our winners today, we have people coming from both ends of that spectrum. 
We try and support campaigners through our training and consultancy, and we work to protect the space to campaign. And there's an awful lot going on around there, but that's another long story. Um, but we, we hope that you stay in touch with us beyond this evening, because today it is all about you guys, our esteemed winners this year, and um, knowing that Sheila herself would be just so very proud to be hearing your stories and being part of this celebration today. Over to you. Thanks, Sue. And just again, just to say on behalf of Tortoise, um, what a privilege it is to be here in the newsroom um, with you all. You know, it's, um, it's something that at the outset, when we set up three years ago, we tried to create a different type of newsroom. We wanted to not do breaking news. We wanted to slow down and go a bit deeper and try and tell stories that made sense of the world and the, the forces of change in the world. But I think uh, over and above that, what we really wanted to do was open our newsroom up as well, because we'd spent our careers in, in big newsrooms that often turned in on themselves and didn't really have a plurality of voices. So we've set up from the start to try and say, everyone gets a seat at the table in our newsroom. And one of the things that we did early on was created something we called the Tortoise Community Network. And it brought together a lot of nonprofits and charities and people who were really fighting for change in their communities. Uh, and we wanted to say to them, you can become members of Tortoise. Um, you know, you don't have to pay to, to do that because we need you in our journalism. We want your uh, those shades of opinion. And that's really where um, our journeys uh, connect with Sheila McKechnie. You know, we, we, we really ad admire the work that they do to amplify people's causes. And, you know, it's led us to uh, today where, you know, we're not... We're journalists, we're not activists, but I think we can feed off the same energy and be inspired by the issues that drive you mad and make you keep going. And so I'm just thrilled that we're going to share our space with you today and hear your stories. Great. Thank you so much to Sue and Dave. Before we jump into the awards, let's hear from Rashid Nix about what's going on for campaigners right now. Research from the Sheila McKechnie Foundation has found that campaigners are more likely to speak out now than they were a year ago. So where does this fresh determination come from? It's been a tough time in the UK. Covid brought death, ill health, disruption and anxiety. This was especially the case for black and South Asian people and people with disabilities. The restrictions put in place to stop the spread meant that many people struggled to work and support to help them through was patchy. The rising cost of living, from food prices to energy bills, has made difficult situations worse. A crisis that's going to follow us out of the pandemic. The past two years will also have a knock-on effect on public health children's development, young people's education, precarious employment, and the crisis in social care. Meanwhile, at COP26, world leaders weren't able to fully agree the ambitious action experts believe was needed to survive the climate emergency. And extreme weather hit all parts of the globe, including storms and flooding in the UK. Most recently, the invasion of Ukraine has thrown a fresh spotlight on the UK's hostile environment for migrants asylum seekers and refugees. And while the need for change is as great as ever, it's getting harder to pursue. Campaigners say the Lobbying Act is still chilling collaboration between campaign groups. And a raft of new legislation came before Parliament this year that could restrict civil liberties and make campaigning more difficult. From restricting protest in the policing bill, to more red tape for campaigns in the elections bill, to removal of the right to judicial review for lots of people, including on unfair asylum decisions and parents fighting for special needs education. At the same time, a vocal minority decided it was time to double down on their war on woke. Whatever that's supposed to mean. A war on being aware of injustice, inequality, really? MPs attack charities for doing their jobs. Ministers attack lawyers and judges for doing their jobs. Newspaper colonists attack anything that moved and looked a little bit too woke. 
Even the RNLI came under fire for rescuing people at sea. Are you for real? So, what do campaigners do? It turns out they thought more deeply about why they campaign. They thought about how it helps achieve their mission. They made the case that just keeping your head down can be a risk in itself. They looked at the rules and they asked, what can we say yes to rather than what should we avoid? And as a result, they feel stronger, more confident and better equipped to resist groundless criticism. SMK also points out that campaigners, while uplifted by the public support that follows political attacks, are also exhausted by rising need and shrinking resources. That's what tonight is all about. Whether you're here to collect an award, to be inspired or to cheer on others, tonight is about anyone who has seen something wrong and wanted to fix it. The legendary campaigner, Sheila McKechnie, always prided herself on being a member of the Awkward Squad. If we want a democracy that thrives on a range of perspectives, we can't shy away from speaking up. Thank you to everyone who has spoken up and everyone who will. Welcome to the Awkward Squad. And now, let's get back to the SMK Campaigner Awards 2022. much Rashid I should have said he's got a great voice he's also really good looking funny and charismatic it's just as well he isn't here I'd embarrass him I couldn't have been it better myself we all need to be a paid up member of this awkward squad whether we're doing it as a change maker actively or we're doing it behind closed doors there's always a way to campaign so let's get started don't forget big shout out to all of you watching at home please use the hashtags love campaigning and SMK Awards 2022 to share the love. We'd love to hear from you. Keep that conversation alive online. And please do pitch in on the Zoom chat. Yes, Zoom is still going uh, if you're joining us digitally. But let's get started now with our first award. It's Best Coalition or Collaboration. Our first award is for Best Coalition or Collaboration, sponsored by the Frederick Mulder Foundation. This award recognizes campaigns led by multiple partners in ways which are creative, respectful and genuinely collaborative. The three shortlisted nominations are State of Nature, Left in Lockdown and Give It Back, Coalition to Ban Virginity Testing and Hymenoplasty. And the winner of the Best Coalition or Collaboration Award is Coalition to Ban Virginity Testing and Hymenoplasty. This coalition brought together women with first-hand experience of the issues involved, community-led groups and professional bodies to press for a change in the law. Coalitions bring together people who share a goal, but often have very different solutions or strategies in mind. This can be difficult, and is doubly so when stigma, misunderstanding and prejudice are added to the mix. The judges were particularly impressed that everyone involved always put women first, each drawing on their unique knowledge and balancing their priorities to ensure that the law was changed to protect all women. to collect the award. We've got Sarah Brown from ECRO, Halala Tahari from Muso, Natasha Rati from Karma Nirvana, Janet Farr from the Royal College of Midwives, and we're also giving a shout out to their coalition partner, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which I feel like I should pay tribute to my dentist <laughs> that I managed to say that. Congratulations on winning this extraordinary award. Coalition is so important in campaigning. Sarah, tell us, this is a wide ranging coalition here tackling a difficult issue. What made it work as a group? So I think that um, first and foremost, women who've experienced these issues and girls were central all the way through. Um, and we are organizations working directly with women through our refuges, through our, um, through our uh, counseling and so on. So we made sure that those voices and experiences were central, but we also had um, experts from medical fields. So Royal College of Midwives and RCOG, 
And I think that combination, bringing us all together, meant that we covered all bases and we were absolutely determined on our, our goal. Um, and also, there's so much negativity happening with legislation at the moment, so we were determined to do something positive. Yeah. Amazing. Natasha, what was it that got the government on board eventually? So I think everything that Sarah has said, the collaboration and the fact that we were able to work together and make the case, you know, survivors are absolutely at the heart of this. And I think amplifying that to politicians, to government, to ministers, um, proved to be so impactful that we're here <laughs> celebrating today. So, yeah, I think everything that, that Sarah has said, pulling all of that together meant that we were able to make that case so strongly. Mm. Can I ask Kalala, what are you going to take away from this experience? What have you learned? Well, uh, I have learned that uh, building up coalition and movement in nowadays is vital and it makes us stronger. By our experiences, by our expertise, by our clients and data or information that we bring it to the table, we make it the momentum of this campaign together. I also wanted to add it that it's really important that we uh, treat our citizen with the same law of this country. No more second class citizen. Mm -hmm. We don't need it to treat the uh, rest of the group because they are because their faith or culture or customs by other laws. We all deserve it to be treated equally. Mm -hmm. And I hope that in future we united again for many other harmful practice that is happening in our society, in our community, with like-minded people like this coalition, that we build it again, movement and coalition, to fight it for more rights for women. Thank yes, you. I'm ready to sign up for anything that you propose, <laughs> Halala. I can feel the energy. Uh, finally, Janet, I wanted to ask you, explain to us the difference this will make in the lives of the women who experience this practice and who will no longer have to suffer in future. Um, firstly, over many centuries, midwives have been responsible for some of the key changes in women's health and well-being. And um, in the past few years, we've worked collaboratively with women's organization to tackle uh, harmful practices. I think it's going to make a difference to the lives of women. It's going to protect girls. It's going to empower them. And it's going to, we're going to, this legislation, this success, will make sure that families no longer think that they own girls. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. Wonderful. <laughs> All the partners in that extraordinary coalition let's look now at our next award best use of law our next award is for best use of law sponsored by the law for change fund this category celebrates a campaign that has successfully used law to drive change whether using legal action to leverage rights and protections or using strategic litigation to strengthen existing or create new legislation the shortlisted nominations are Access for All, Stop the GP Data Grab, Good Law Project during 2021. And the winner of the Best Use of Law Award is Access for All. Sally, Victoria and Sarah are three deaf mothers who took their daughters to a Little Mix concert. They wanted to enjoy the event with their kids but were denied proper British Sign Language interpretation. They challenged that decision under the Equality Act, and they won. Just two weeks later, other venues started to get on board. Wembley Stadium announced they will offer British Sign Language interpretation as a guaranteed service at every live concert, making them the UK's biggest venue to offer it. This is a huge step forward in deaf people's fight for equality, and will mean that thousands of deaf people will be able to enjoy live music events at any given date. extraordinary case, Sally Reynolds, Victoria Nelson and Sarah Cassandro. Congratulations to all three of you and everyone who supported your case. Thank you so much for the work that you've done. Sally, unfortunately, this was probably not the first time you'd experienced uh, struggling getting proper BSL interpreters in place. 
What was it about this experience in particular that made you decide to do something about it? Well, I mean, the three of us, we're profoundly deaf. We were born deaf and we've been through our life experiences deaf. So at that time, I think it was about five years ago, it was quite a long time ago now, um, and the, the Little Mix concert was on, and our children said they'd like to go. Our three daughters were really excited by it. They're all hearing, but they all wanted to go. So we bought some tickets, and we thought, well, why not? Why don't we ask for a BSL interpreter to be provided for us? So we asked. We asked the venue, we asked the promoter, and it went back and forth and back and forth, and the promoter said it's not, it's not our responsibility. The venue said it wasn't theirs, but in the end, they all responded no. So in order to find a way to change that, we needed to get some support. There's, there's, we had no legal contact at all at the time, so we eventually had to, we actually found um, a, a solicitor called Chris Fry, and we said to him, is there any chance he can support us in this? He agreed to work with a barrister who's here with us today, tonight, Cathy Cassily, who's sitting here tonight. So thank you for coming, Cathy. And they supported us, and we are so grateful for their help, because without their guide and their support, we would have had barriers throughout, and we would never have got this far. Um, yeah, I mean, they were the ones who, with the legal help of the legal team, we were able to procure interpreters um, for the the the, the, um, the concert. But we wanted the whole concert to be um, interpreted. We were only actually given interpreters for the main act, and so in the end, we we brought the case to have the same experience of other people of other hearing parents. We want to be able to experience what hearing parents experience with their children when they go to events. And we were really motivated to get things changed for other deaf people. Mm. Victoria, going to court against a big company is a really big deal. How did you feel during those moments? Oh. <laughs> Absolutely, it was in an incredible feeling. I mean, for all of those years and everything kept getting delayed all the time and it was a massive legal challenge. We had so many highs, so many lows and it was such an issue. But at the time, I think we were just so frightened. We were stressed. It really actually also tested our friendship. And our story isn't unique. This happens to deaf people all the time. Every day they face these barriers. So we're hoping to raise awareness for the, that with this case so that all, all service providers embed access from the very start and they don't just say no from the, from the get-go. Also, I mean, this was a test case, so we had to do our own fundraising for this. I mean, with, for the legal costs. So that meant that we, I mean, we had to actually get support from family, friends, the deaf community. And for that, we are immensely grateful to everybody who supported us. Sarah, will you continue to campaign or has this been so exhausting that you've had enough? What, stop? No, never, never. There are so many things. There are so many barriers. There are so many struggles. We're, we need to break those barriers down. I work as a teacher of the deaf with deaf children, and I want those deaf children to have access to events and things. It's the same as hearing children when they go to events. In lockdown, another, I mean, another um, barrier was that the Scotland, Scottish and Irish governments and the Welsh gov governments, they all had interpreters next to their leaders so that it, all the deaf people in their countries understood what was going on. We had nothing. We campaigned for that as well. We had to say, come on, we need, we need to know what's going on. And for months, there was no access for deaf people. And this is England, and they denied us that access. It makes you feel worthless and ignored. So most West End musicals have maybe once a year captions. Cinemas, they'll show films maybe one in the week when we're at work. Most deaf people do work, and they have these captions in the day. So there is now a growing awareness of deaf people in the world. So how 
do they provide access? They need BSL interpreters, we need captions. And if organisations don't understand how to do that, just ask. Thank you so much. Congratulations to Access for All. Now let's move to our next award, Best Consumer Campaign. Our next award is for Best Consumer Campaign, sponsored by Witch. This award recognises campaigns that successfully challenge poor or unfair consumer practice or promote or strengthen consumer rights and protection. The three shortlisted nominations are the Campaign for Accessible Emergency Contraception, Energy Market Meltdown, no to European Super League. And the winner of the Best Consumer Campaign Award is... The Campaign for Accessible Emergency Contraception. The British Pregnancy Advisory Service has campaigned since 2017 for pharmacies to reduce the inflated cost of emergency contraception, which they say is profiteering for women's basic health care. In late 2021, journalist Rose Stokes noticed that Boots were selling the morning after pill at 50% off as part of a sale offer. She joined forces with BPAS and Dame Diana Johnson MP, alongside thousands of supporters, to call for the price to be made permanent. In January 2022, Boots announced that it would reduce the price of the morning after pill to £10, an almost 40% reduction. This prompted other major retail brands, including Superdrug, Lloyds and Asda to follow suit. Now, this important medication will be more accessible to those who need it. A huge leap forward for women's reproductive rights. Stokes and Catherine O'Brien from the British Pregnancy Advisory Service. Rose, <coughs> I'm so glad you could be here. Maybe you're not going to be alone. I'm just... <laughs> I was just going to say someone didn't use the morning after pill. <laughs> A testament to the need for how, accessible emergency How, how soon are you due? Uh, Imminent. Imminently. OK, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, Catherine, let me ask you first. The British Pregnancy Advisory Service, which clearly has given very good advice to Rose, uh, has been working on access to emergency contraception for some time. But what was it about this particular moment in time that galvanised the campaign? I think people were just really angry. And I think that Rose's work really brought um, what is something that is simmered um, amongst women and anyone who needed emergency contraception for so many years. Whenever we talk about this, there's always somebody in the room who goes, oh yeah, I remember my experience. I had to, you know, forego uh, buying lunch that day so that I could afford it. And I think that it was really about bringing everyone together and going, actually, this isn't acceptable in a way that actually, especially as women, we get expected to put up with things in a way that I don't, I don't think we're standing for anymore, so. Yeah. yeah. Rose, do you think that the pandemic has been helpful in changing attitudes towards women's health care? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, Clearly, you've had a very productive <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> um, I think that people are probably um, online more, like paying more attention to these sorts of campaigns. Like, I think that. Um, People's anger, as you said, are getting is getting uh, more potent, and I think people are sort of um, uh, coming together more to demand better standards. And when it comes to something like this, like I mean, I just want to highlight that BPAS have been campaigning for this for about five years. Like I, I just piggybacked off the on the back of the campaign, um, but uh, it's been an issue that's been simmering for a long time, um, and something that I think is should just be a basic right for women. Um, we kind of got to the stage where we were fed up of the unnecessary profiting on, on basic health care. And so, um, yeah, we, we took our moment and, and it worked. Brilliant. Congratulations <laughs> to BPAS and Rose Stokes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's move to our next award category, David and Goliath. The next award is David and Goliath, sponsored by the Joseph Roundtree Reform Trust. This award is all about the little guys. 
It celebrates individuals or small campaign groups that take on much bigger organisations and challenge vested power. The three shortlisted nominations are End Our Cladding Scandal Operation Noah's Bright Now Campaign Hashtag Facebook Has No Standards Coventry Youth Activists And the winner of the David and Goliath Award is Hashtag Facebook Has No Standards Coventry Youth Activists CYA's Hashtag Facebook Has No Standards campaign set out to change the way online disability hate is handled by social media platforms. Despite rising levels of disability hate crime online, they always got the same response when they try to report a problem. The posts don't breach Facebook's community standards. CYA's response is that Facebook doesn't have any standards. How can they when they allow hateful, ableist posts to remain online? They decided to take on the corporate giant and secure the meeting with Facebook, something that many larger organisations have failed to do. However, after this, all communication stopped. Undeterred, they continued their fight with a Mad Hatter's tea party outside the London HQ, inviting Facebook to sit down with them and talk. They also worked to ensure that issues facing people with disabilities are not ignored as part of the online safety bill meeting MPs and peers to share their ideas. The difference the campaign has had on the young people in the group has been huge. Young people with anxiety, who would often find social situations overwhelming, stood outside Facebook HQ sharing their own story in front of a crowd on a megaphone. Young people with learning disabilities, often excluded by society, ran online meetings with people in positions of power to hold them to account. We think the campaign is extraordinary for its ambition, impact and empowering energy. Joining us now we have Coventry youth activists Jerry Manda, Amanda Thomas and Molly Gillespie. Congratulations on this amazing award. Jerry, as Rashid was mentioning there, governments struggle to take on big companies like Facebook. What was it that made a group of young activists from Coventry think that they could make a difference? Uh, well, as um, disabled people, we're so used to um, being ignored and not being listened to that we, we I think we're now of the opinion of well, what, what can we, what can we what can we lose there's, you know there's nothing to lose um and i think that as a um i always say it's really hard to expect people to understand what something's like unless they've lived through it and everyone within within coventry youth activists will do see it for short for the rest of this because it might extend the speech <laughs> but um everyone within in sia um they, they've all experienced that and i think when you've got the personal experience it in increases the the drive to 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 make the change, um, and and as the award says, it just really it just brings see it together in in such a short space of words because, um, you know, as a, as the story goes, David has to show courage to come forward and to take on things throughout the world, and every single day, each member of C, both as a group and in individual lives every day have to bring great courage just to sometimes just to leave their homes, um, let alone work or try and make a difference. So it's just, uh, we're just so incredibly um, thankful to have our voices heard. And as our campaign says, we're still, still fighting really hard to even get the most explicit hate speech taken down um, towards disabled people. So we really need to um, raise the awareness that within the protective communities um, and the marginalised communities is, is disabled people and we're not as advanced in equality towards disabled people as we might think. As I know previous groups here today will, will understand what I mean when I say we're much more behind than, than we believe. Mm, brilliantly said. Amanda, what advice would you have for other campaigners, especially if they're taking on a really big company? Uh, Find your voice and don't give up and find the right people and energy 
and Facebook has no standards. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you. Huge congratulations to all of you. Well thank done. You. Thank you. Let's move now to our next award, Amplifying Voices. Our next award is Amplifying Voices, sponsored by the John Elliman Foundation. This award recognises campaigns that are either led by or give voice and profile to those groups who are least heard. The three shortlisted nominations are Fighting with Pride, an honourable future for LGBT plus veterans. Save the Children's Parent Campaigners, hashtag Keep the Lifeline. Safe Roots, Save Lives. And the winner of the Amplifying Voices Award is Safe Roots, Save Lives. In March 2021, the government announced changes to the UK asylum system. The Nationality and Borders Bill would prevent refugees forced to take dangerous journeys to the UK from having safe routes to flee war and persecution. Three groups led by young refugees and asylum seekers, Safe Passage Young Leaders, the Cran Youth Forum and Hummingbird Young Leaders gather together on Zoom to call for safe routes and get their voices heard. They made a case for opening safe routes to the UK through personal testimony and policy recommendations. Their headline message is that safe routes save lives. During debates on the bill, MPs and peers shared the young people's powerful testimonies. In February, the House of Lords voted against the government and for the amendments on family reunion and resettlement. A big win. The Nationality and Borders Act is now law, but the campaign views their work as a marathon, not a sprint. They've built a powerful movement of young refugee voices across the UK, which will be the foundation for future campaigns. And it's just made me really emotional. <laughs> Joining us now, Joel Mordy and Tech Latest from Ayan from Youth Leaders from Safe Roots, Save Lives. So thrilled that you were able to do this. Congratulations to you and all the other young leaders uh, who brought your case so powerfully to Parliament. Joel, there's a bit of a theme developing here about individuals and small groups taking on governments, uh, managing to create legislation where uh, others have failed. What was it? about your message that you think was listened to finally? Um, I think because we had a strong why, um, that was obviously evident. And because most of us young leaders, we do come from refugee and asylum backgrounds. So obviously we used our lived experiences, we're experts by experience, and leveraging that, and obviously being um, side by side with the nonprofit Safe Passage, holding us all the way um, on ethics and how to lobby parliament and do it right, I think that was why, you know, we did go as far as we did. Um, obviously, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, yeah, there were our, 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 our fuel to our fire, because obviously, when you have lived experiences, no one can campaign better than yourself. But um, yeah, Safe Passage was there all the way, um, leveraging Parliament, MPs, Lords, um, never taking no for an answer, um, having them listen to us um, via Zoom, in person, all the way, we went all the way. Um, so yeah, I think that was you know evident through our, our journey so far. And also the fact that um, I am a recipient of the Sheila, Sheila Kitchney Foundation taking a chance on me back in 2020 um, by not giving me not just one, not two, not three, but 10 scholarships um, when it comes to unleashing social power. And obviously, I leveraged all of that and brought that into, you know, Safe Passage and, you know, share that with other young leaders. Um, that is was also evident. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you so what much. a great tribute to the Take a Chance Award. You took the chance and yeah. there you are. Yeah. And that's Safe amazing. Passage did just that. They amplified our voices. Yeah, that's brilliant. Tekle, what advice would you have to others who have lived experience about how you take that and use it to change policy? Yeah, so um, what I can say is um, be more active, um, uh, just campaign, and because like that first hand experience, that matters. Um, I think a lot of people, due to a lot of barriers, they don't come those with first-hand experience. 
But what I can say is like, you are heard more than you think. And those policymakers, they really want to hear that real and uh, evidence-based uh, real stories. Um, and those like, those first-hand experience people are like, are the people who can be, who, bring, who brings that to the table. So yeah, so be more active is what I can say. Mm, amazing, congratulations, Safe Roots, Save mm. Lives. Thank you. Thank you so much. nearly halfway through the SMK National Campaigner Awards, so we think it's time to revisit one of last year's winners to find out about the differences their campaigning has made. One in eight members of the population are suffering with food insecurity, and the problem is going up with the cost of living crisis and inflation affecting food prices and energy prices. People are having to make impossible decisions between heating their homes, paying a bill, and buying food. Without campaigning, you know, that challenge uh, gets starker and starker. The latest figures are that seven million people suffered from food insecurity in the last six months. Two million of those are children. At the same time, 1.3 billion meals worth of food, good to eat food is going to waste every year. So bear shares right in the middle, trying to get that good to eat surplus food uh, before it goes to waste and becomes an environmental problem to charities that use it to incentivize people to come into their service and then they then provide wraparound care that helps tackle causes of those individuals' vulnerabilities. We were very humbled to win the Sheila McKechnie Foundation Award for campaigning. It was a campaign aimed at shining a spotlight on holiday hunger, uh, which is where children who would normally get a meal during term time didn't get access to that type of support during the holiday period. It was a very unknown issue, and in fact it was described as hidden hunger. We called the campaign Activate and ran it for two summers and then Marcus Rashford came to support us just ahead of the summer holidays uh, in 2020, just as the pandemic hit and just as we went into lockdown. The problem of holiday hunger was exacerbated by lockdown, so children weren't at school and weren't able to receive a free school meal at that time. So it was super urgent that we got the commitments that we wanted from government and from the food industry to support those children and their families as quickly as possible. If we hadn't done the campaign, there would have been less support for children during that critical period in their lives. So, the £440 million that was leveraged from government that went into support just wouldn't have occurred uh, and those children would have suffered with increased levels of food insecurity, uh, increased anxiety, increased worry and for their families too. It's absolutely vital that successful campaigning happens. Without campaigning there's no support towards organisations like Fair Share, it means there's no mission, there's no impact. Vulnerable communities suffer and that would lead to devastating consequences. Amazing film, great to catch up with one of our previous winners and see what they've achieved. Don't forget that every one of our finalists featured here tonight is on the SMK website at smk.org.uk. Do go and find out more about the shortlisted campaigns. It'd be great to continue this conversation online, sharing with all of you at home, share the love. Uh, please keep on tweeting uh, using Instagram. Hashtag love campaigning is the hashtag hashtag to use plus hashtag SMK Awards 2022 and you know we want to see some pictures of you celebrating and jumping up and down on your sofas what are you drinking get into the vibe you know that it's time let's go now to our next award best community campaign our next award is for best community campaign sponsored by the Lloyds Bank Foundation the award celebrates a successful campaign that has taken place at a local community level it could be led by one or many, but will have led to a change that benefits all or a significant portion of the local community. The three shortlisted nominations are Hashtag It Takes Balls to Talk A Place to Sit Ward's Corner Community Plan And the winner of the Best Community Campaign Award is Ward's Corner Community Plan Latin Village in Seven Sisters, North London is an indoor market made up mainly of Latinx owned shops. It sits in a site called Ward's Corner and has been a hub for various Latin American migrant communities since the 90s. In 2003, it was listed for redevelopment despite being an asset of community value recognized by the United Nations. 
Plans to demolish the historic buildings and market mobilized a wide-ranging grassroots campaign by local residents, market traders and businesses. People staged mass community events and protests, ran legal campaigns, fundraised and crucially developed an alternative community plan. This would restore and manage the site to benefit people living and working locally. The campaign has achieved some incredible successes, including a successful judicial review, gaining planning permission twice for the community plan and demonstrating its financial viability. In August 2021, the developer withdrew its proposals. Building owner Transport for London committed to a community-led development and Harringay Council announced its support for the community plan. With the threat of demolition finally gone, a major fundraising effort is now on the way to make the plan a reality. Give it up for all the community plan! Woo! Thank you so much. And we're joined here now by Carlos Burgos, Lithia Corina Germak, and Nicolas Amayo from Ward's Corner Community Plan. Huge! Congratulations to you. What a fantastic project. Carlos, it took 20 years to get to this point. What do you think gave this campaign the staying power it needed for all of that time? I think partially is the Latin American character. <laughs> because uh, when I got involved, uh, there were starting evictions. And uh, I uh, am working also with the Pedro Achata Trust, mm -hmm. and they make me aware of the situation. I was invited to go have a look and see what we can help. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened is that everybody was packing, you know, because they didn't want to be evicted. So we challenged that. That was the beginning. And when we met with the councillors, they said to everybody, you don't have any rights. Mm -hmm. and that was the ignition of the whole uh, campaign, mm -hmm. because everybody has rights. And most of the traders in the market have British passports already. So it doesn't make sense, that phrase. And uh, later on, there had been similar challenges. And what they don't understand is that the more they push down the Latin American community, the more stronger and determined they become. Fantastic. Uh, last question, really. This was involving, in the end, Transport for London, Haringey Council. How did you finally get them on board properly? Uh, well, there is uh, many factors, uh, not necessarily because they were finally convinced. <laughs> it was more of convenience. Since there is a public land, therefore the responsibility for that is the transport for London. Mm -hmm. They have neglected that piece of land. Mm -hmm. and the building, mm -hmm. and when Granger, the developer, resigned, they could see that uh, the responsibility was upon them, you know, mm -hmm. of accepting the neglect. Mm -hmm. But because there was a 106 agreement uh, for the CPO, which the council is responsible. There was a change in the composition of the council, mm -hmm. which was more in favor mm -hmm. uh, in the community, really. Mm -hmm. And we have already a, a planning application approved. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there was a ready-made solution mm -hmm. for the embarrassment. Yeah. Of seeing... Convenient. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Brilliant. Well, congratulations. I feel your quiet determination, and I certainly would not want to get in your way. Congratulations to all of your group. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.
up, we have the Young Campaigner Award. Up next is the Young Campaigner Award, sponsored by the Blargrave Trust. This award celebrates campaigns instigated, delivered and led by a person or people under the age of 30. The three shortlisted nominations are Bite Back 2030 Youth Board, Choked Up, Quadro Tenibor, Campaign for Better Living Conditions Across the UK. And the winner of the Young Campaigner Award is Quadro Twenty Boa. Quadro knows what it's like to live in squalid housing. After a succession of poor quality temporary homes, he and his family finally moved into a permanent home on the Eastfields Estate in South London. But their living conditions worsened and their housing association landlord, Clarion, failed to carry out essential repairs. Sadly, Quadro's father became terminally ill and the family nursed their dying father in a damp, vermin and fly-infested flat. Quadro turned his family's awful experience into activism. He said, I decided to put my foot down and say enough is enough, not just for myself, but for millions of social housing tenants across the UK. Since then, he's shaken up the social housing sector and become a campaigning powerhouse. At 23, he's appeared across broadcast and print media and featured in the big issues list of the top 100 changemakers. On Twitter, he publicizes social landlords' failures, posting questions and photos directly to them. Tweets go viral, attracting media attention. Since his public shaming, Clarion claims to have knocked on the door of each and every home in Eastfields to tell residents of its plans for the area. It says it has completed more than 600 repairs on Eastfields since June 2021, as well as 24 kitchen and bathroom replacements. He's now studying at University of Leicester, but Quadro continues to help families living in horrific conditions, shaming landlords into carrying out necessary work. He recently met with Secretary of State Michael Gove and Mayor of London Sadiq Khan to advise on changes to regulation. He wants landlords to be properly sanctioned for failures and stricter and more detailed regulation to prevent anything of this scale ever occurring again. Quajo here tonight. Congratulations you're on your you. award. Amazing. I want to ask you one question, which I think is something everyone in this room and watching at home is going to want to know about. You are a student. You've mm -hmm. done all of this work unpaid. I was yeah. listening. Oh, yeah, Michael Gove and Sadiq Khan. Hopefully, if you do some work for them, they might pay you. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I guess they probably won't, but they should. Um, how do you maintain your motivation doing this as a volunteer, as many who work in campaigning are forced to do? Um, in terms of my, my motivation, I think it would. It's, it's just my personal story and what happened to, to my dad and growing up in that environment and knowing how much of an impact it had on us. But also day to day going into people's homes and seeing them in the same situation, if not worse, that I was in mm -hmm. two years ago. And not just that, but being able to hold housing providers accountable, hold politicians accountable, hold the government accountable and get results from that. That's the sort of satisfaction and motivation, seeing people that are suffering then get moved out and continue living the life that they deserved and was prevented from having for so long is where I get the motivation to continue. And I think that's what's carried me through the last almost year to the day. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. So inspiring. Congratulations, Kwajo Twenaboa. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Before we move on to our next category, I love it when they do this, the judges from this award wanted to give a special commendation to another on the shortlist. You can tell how competitive these campaigns are. There are so many amazing people out there doing great work. So it's great to hear this commendation. The Choked Up campaign was created by black and brown sixth formers who were outraged that the people most at risk of the health impacts of air pollution were 
by people of colour and working class communities. They want government to recognise that air pollution isn't solely a health and environmental issue, but a social justice one too. The judges were particularly impressed at their ability to collaborate as a group while studying, once again full time, and draw on their experiences to guide the campaign and advocate so effectively and creatively. So well done to them at Choked Up. And don't forget, you can find out more about all of our shortlisted entries, winners and runners up at smk.org.uk. Up next, Long Term Achievement Award, which recognises someone who has dedicated a large part of their life to a cause. This year is a bit special because our recipient, I don't want to embarrass him, but he has just celebrated his 70th birthday. So we're very pleased to contribute to the party, if a little belatedly. We invited Baroness Liz Barker herself, a veteran campaigner, to introduce this year's Long Term Achievement award winner. Peter is an absolute pain to people in power and that's what makes him great. He sees what's wrong in the world and he sits and thinks about what the answer to that problem is and then he works out who are the people in power who should be doing things about it but they aren't and he goes at them and he doesn't give up until he wins. And that's a hallmark of a great campaigner. It's not a proper LGBT event if Peter's not there when I turn up, but I can't remember when we first ever met. He's just been around in my life, I suppose, first in my consciousness from the Bermondsey by-election. He was portrayed in the media as being this very lefty rebel. Yeah, he was a strong character. He did have strong beliefs and all that, but actually he was, he was a great person to to talk to and over the time I think became something of a mentor to lots of people. He hates injustice and when he sees people who are being treated unfairly for whatever reason he has to go and act. He's often I think wrongly labelled as an LGBT campaigner. He is a human rights campaigner and an environmental campaigner. And he makes common cause between different groups of people who are suffering injustice. And he works with them and builds coalitions, all tied together with a powerful sense of standing up for human rights. When Peter came along to Britain in the 1970s, we'd only just recently stopped being illegal as gay people. But it was still very much the case that people were subject to discrimination in everyday life. Gay people were living in fear. And along came Peter and a bunch of brave individuals, really brave individuals, who started this whole process leading to where we are today. Peter is famously, in his own words, a rebel from the Rockingham estate. But he spent a lifetime outside of this building, arguing for change, trying to make the lives of LGBT people better and he has succeeded by bringing about change inside Parliament. You couldn't have a worthier winner than Peter. For 50 years, he has never given up going for the things that he believes are important to all of us and achieving such great success. He has been an inspiration to other campaigners as well. He's taught people how to do things which win. You know, he has got the results for all of us and we're all the better for it. My message to him is he's in danger of becoming a national treasure, I think. Uh, he's definitely a hero to our community and I think that he should know that deep down, for all that he has driven us a bit mad on occasions, we are very, very fond of him. So yeah, very worthy winner. Congratulations to Peter Tatchell for this Lifetime Achievement Award. Happy birthday and congratulations. How are you feeling on receiving this award? It is a huge, huge honour. I want to thank SMK and Liz Bach for that beautiful um, introduction. Very generous words. But of course, I'm one among many. It's we together that make the change. Um, I do want to pay just a personal tribute to Sheila McKechnie, who I knew going back four decades ago. We were both working on homelessness. 
I was particularly focused on the welfare and rights of single homeless people who back in those days were forced to live in squalid Dickensian uh, workhouse style hostels uh, under appalling conditions. And we made a successful campaign to get those improved. So I'd like to just ask all of you to join me in giving a huge round of applause to Sheila for her magnificent life and work. I do accept this award for me, but also on behalf of all the thousands of people who've collaborated with me over the last five decades. It has been a collective effort. And uh, I just thank everybody who worked with me because together we have achieved some extraordinary changes. Um, I'd like to dedicate my acceptance of this award to the heroic democratic activists in Ukraine and Syria who are resisting Russian aggression, risking their lives and liberty. Please give them your solidarity. Yes. As you say, Peter, five decades of campaigning for gay rights and equality for LGBTQ plus communities. But where did it all start? What was the catalyst right at the start? My first human rights awareness was in 1963 when I was 11 years old. I heard about the bombing of a black church in Birmingham, Alabama in the United States where four young girls about my own age were murdered by white racists. I was only 11 years old, but I understood immediately just how wrong that was. And that prompted my interest in and support for the black civil rights movement. I wasn't in America, but I, from a distance, supported their just freedom struggle. And you will see that in my five decades of activism, I've adapted many of their inspiring ideals, values, and methods of nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience. So a huge tribute to the influence the black civil rights movement had on me and how it shows that we can all learn from others. Different movements can learn from each other. And of course, when we share our knowledge, share our experience, share our successes, we are all collectively stronger. And as that brilliant VT showed, no stranger to controversy, and you don't look a day older than when they're first bundling you into a police van. <laughs> How do you consider the role of conflict and disruption to matter in campaigning? Well, I think if you look throughout history, you'll see that all throughout the ages, sometimes people struggling for justice have had to be provocative and confrontational. They've had to shake up the establishment. They've had to be disruptive. So I think of the Chartists, the Suffragettes, and more recently, Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, and Me Too. Challenging authority, challenging the consensus that has often been the catalyst to open the door to change. So I'm very proud to be sometimes part of the awkward squad and I know all of you have done the same. And thank you all, because in this room are a fantastic, magnificent collection of change makers, and you have made a difference. Congratulations again to Peter Tatchell. Wow. Oh. So, so inspiring. Now to campaign of the year. Our next category is the Campaign of the Year Award, sponsored by Changing Ideas. This award celebrates the outstanding campaign of the past year, not just because of what they won, but also how they won it. The shortlisted nominations are COVID-19 Bereaved Family for Justice, Stop Torture Impunity, Hashtag Scrap Six Months. And the winner of the Campaign of the Year Award is Stop Torture Impunity. The British Overseas Operations Bill included proposals that would make it harder to prosecute British military personnel for abuses, including torture, carried out overseas. Freedom from Torture and the Survivors Speak Out Network coordinated a campaign to prevent that. The legislation, with its presumption against prosecution, would have protected British Armed Forces personnel from allegations of acts of torture and other crimes committed abroad more than five years earlier. The campaign was co-designed 
with torture survivors and worked with a broad coalition. Many thousands of supporters took part, ensuring that legislation was not allowed to just sail free. By popularizing the term, the torture bill, the campaign put the government on the back foot, forcing it to constantly explain that it remained opposed to torture. Ultimately, the strength of feeling in the Lords was such that the government was obliged to back down. In the end, the UK did not undermine the global torture ban, which would have set a dangerous precedent for other governments to follow, and polling suggests that the campaign raised public awareness, with more people now believing torture is always wrong. Congratulations to Steve Crawshaw from Freedom From Torture and Sepa De Sahar from Survivors Speak Out. I love it when it says they put the government on the back foot. Uh, this seems like such an obvious campaign, but unfortunately it isn't. Uh, the voices of people who had experienced torture were a huge part of this. What difference do you think that made? Uh, well, thank you for this interesting question. Uh, I think... Um, the, the first answer is we are expert by experience. So we know how does it feel when, when the torture happens to a person and uh, the effect of torture, the lifetime, lifetime effect of the torture on, on people um, who've been subject to torture. Uh, so it is uh, basically, it, it's wrong for some people who even probably never, never experienced, never seen a conflict zone, to say it's okay. You can torture people. We we will let you get get away with it. So, um, I think we we just wanted to uh, stand up against government and tell them this is wrong. You cannot you cannot create impunity for torturers and perpetrators and set an example for all dictators and perpetrators around the world that torturing people is okay. Um, uh, so that, that would be uh, absolutely a green light to all the, you know, all the dictators around the world. So you can torture people and you'll be fine. You can get away with it. We just wanted to stop this and tell the government and the whole world that torture is never okay. Thank you so much for your work. Steve, for everyone in this room and for many of the campaigners and activists watching at home, how does one shift the government's position? What's the secret? I think that probably the starting point is just having belief. We are confronting so many dark things, certainly in this country, but around the world. But in this country, so many things look impossible to change. Um, and. It's not that you will win, but that you may win. It seemed almost impossible, as Sepedi described. You have a, a government that has an 80-seat majority. It was a manifesto commitment. These unbelievable things to create torture immunity, impunity seemed so extraordinary and undefeatable. But then we managed to energize people and those voices, the survivor voices, supporter voices, people across the country, and also people who were not necessarily natural activists, but also bringing them in, finding the, the generals, the former NATO secretary general, the bishops, all of the establishment, if you like, was incredibly important, realizing that they wanted to confront that the lawlessness, if you like, that sadly we were seeing that was coming from the government. And they kept accusing us of lies. They told the survivors that they were talking, quote unquote, garbage. When we first criticized the bill, they said, this is not what it's doing. We said, this is what it's doing. And I think that sense of belief and hope of what's going to be achieved. It's often hope is described as some kind of naive thing. Actually, it's the opposite. You need to do the hard work that goes with it, and then you really do have a chance. And I hope this can inspire. We heard earlier about the, the Borders Bill, which has gone through, but that Absolutely, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sense that we can still defeat that. Britain is better than this. And that is absolutely clear in every sense. So I, I would love to think, we feel deeply honored to have received the award, but I hope that it will inspire others to think, yeah, actually impossible things can, can change. They, they really have. We feel so moved uh, uh, where we ended up. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for defeating the undefeatable. Congratulations again, campaign of the year. Oh. Thank you very much.
Now we have we have a chance in campaign of the year to give a commendation before we move on to our final category. The judges for campaign of the year wanted to give a special commendation to another one on the shortlist. The COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice campaign formed of over 6,000 people who lost their loved ones to COVID-19, who secured the statutory inquiry into the way the pandemic was handled. The campaign has ensured that the experiences of diverse communities are heard and it kept pandemic related issues firmly in the news when the government was trying to move the story on to other things. They also created the National COVID Memorial Wall directly across the Thames from the Houses of Parliament. It began as a visible memorial to their loved ones but soon became a focus for national grief and a symbol of something we're really still collectively going through. It's a gift for the nation and for that we would like to thank them. That's the COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice campaign. Well done. So we come now to our final award of the night, Campaigner of the Year, and we have last year's winner, the brilliant Jolie Brearley from Pregnant Then Screwed to tell us all about Campaigner of the Year. Our last award is for the Campaigner of the Year. It recognises and celebrates a change maker, campaigner, agitator or disruptor who has demonstrated a significant commitment to social change, locally or nationally. The shortlisted nominations are Zeta Holborn for her work to halt mass deportations by charter flight. Mickey Phipps for her work to advocate for fellow breast cancer patients and better cancer care during the pandemic. Jack Munro for her anti-poverty work, especially hunger relief. Great to see those shortlisted entries. I jumped the gun there because I was so excited to hear again from Jolie Brearley because I'm a big fan of Pregnant Then Screwed. So let's hear now to introduce the winner of this final award, last year's winner, Jolie Brearley from Pregnant Then Screwed. It was an honour to be SMK's Campaigner of the Year in 2021. And now I'm delighted to introduce this year's winner. This person is an outstanding campaigner, certainly an agitator and definitely a disruptor. She spent some difficult years trying to find work as a single mother and support her family on a low income, facing all of the mental and physical strain that comes with financial hardship. She started writing a blog detailing the day-to-day -day pain that poverty causes and the ingenuity that it demands. Her love of cooking gave her the skills to eke out as much taste and nutrition from her tiny food budget as possible. And with characteristic solidarity and generosity alongside her struggles, she shared the recipes and tips with her growing readership. People responded in their droves. Many took huge comfort in knowing that their own experience was not unusual, that their struggles to cope were not simply personal failures. She knew that helping people get through the day at a time was important, but not a solution. Policies, attitudes and political will had to change. Her own experiences became the driver of her campaigning and political activism, particularly on poverty and hunger. Recently, her meticulous record keeping and planning allowed her to show how the official inflation rates fail to capture the way that food prices are rising faster for people on the lowest incomes. Her detailed Twitter thread on the subject was read by 26 million people and sparked a media storm. ASDA quickly responded by making its cheapest food ranges available in all 581 stores, which increased the number of customers who could access them. The Office of National Statistics announced that it would publish a breakdown to show what the headline inflation figure really means for people on different incomes. And in March, she gave evidence to the Work and Pension Select Committee, warning that the cost of living crisis 
could prove fatal for some. Despite her successes, she knows that there is so much more to be done. In her words, until people realize benefits doesn't mean scrounger and austerity isn't a fun middle-class way to grow your own vegetables, there's still a lot of work to do. Have you figured it out yet? This year's much deserved Campaigner of the Year Award goes to the trailblazing and incredible Jack Monroe. Jack Monroe, we're so thrilled that you could be here with us. And that was a beautiful tribute to your work from Jolie Brearley. She said it all. I'm fascinated to see you there. You know, it makes you cringe, this kind of thing, right? Because it's not about you. But how does it feel to receive this award? There's a duality to it, I have to be honest, because I, I, I am an incredibly awkward human being in real life. Um, and not in the Sheila McKechnie useful way, but in the blushing like an idiot in the corner kind of way. Um, but also, it's kind of like, it's very nice for the work that I do to be recognised, but it's a damn shame that it's necessary at all. And it's, it's necessary to a degree that it is recognised. I mean, I would like nothing more than to quietly fade away into the Cypriot mountain regions of my forefathers, yomping around, herding goats and writing 30 quid cookbooks, but it's not going to happen for a while yet, is it? <laughs> <laughs> we hope to see you in those mountains sometime, but we need you for now. Jolie was mentioning there that obviously the food crisis continues. Can you tell us what we can do to help or what hopeful activist ideas are, are on the horizon? I mean, I've been feeling this for a while now, but it does kind of feel like we're on the cusp of a sea change as a society, where enough people have realised that the trickle-down economics are not trickling down anything useful and that the last 12 years of austerity cuts are are making people worse and worse off. And they're like, hang on, this isn't what we voted for. And oh, actually, yes, it is. And people are realising that actually people are getting worse and worse and worse off. And at the point where I think 7 million people missed a meal last month in new statistics from the Food Foundation, that is one in 10 people in the UK. Mm -hmm. And a third of those were children. So I think that we're getting to a point now where people are realising this isn't some obscure thing that Guardian columnists like me churn out in the paper all angrily to berate the government. This is a very, very real thing that's happening on our doorsteps, in our communities, in our neighbourhoods, in every single street in the country. Mm -hmm. And so that sea change of fury and activism and righteous anger seems to be translating into donations to food banks, people asking how they can help, donations to beauty banks, financial donations, cash donations, signing petitions, rallying your MP. People are finally getting to a point where that fizzing injustice that sits at the heart of every single campaigner mm. is sort of contagious. Mm. And hopefully it stays contagious enough that that sea change happens because the, the way things are at the moment is not sustainable. And a final word, if you would, Jack, to all the campaigners out there who maybe feel the way that you do about things, that they'd rather not be on, in the spotlight, they'd rather not have to find the words to express this, they didn't get into this to have, a, you know, a sort of very prominent role, they'd love to do it behind the scenes. Where do you find your strength to keep going and push away that voice that says, oh, I just want to go and hide in the mountains? <laughs> Can you tell I just want to go and hide in the mountains right now? I think people, when they meet me in real life, they can't quite believe I'm the same feisty little oik that's on Twitter. Because I'm like, no, I, tr I literally tremble if you look at me. Um, but um, I think it's the fact that all of our voices count and all of our voices matter. I was just a single mum with a blog that 17 people read, sitting in my freezing gold flat in South End, tapping away on my mobile. And something about that caught with people and people identified with it and people reached back to it and people shared their stories and it's again it's that contagion of when you when you're in a dire situation whether you're an activist or a campaigner or just a human being in poverty or in, in difficulty it's very very easy to feel like you're alone 
and it diminishes you. It diminished me as a person. It made me feel small and my whole world was small and like I didn't matter. But actually th the ability to connect with other people and just sort of reach out across the internet or across community groups or across campaigning organisations and go, oh, hey, I'm going through this thing. Oh, you're going through that thing too. Or you've been through that thing and come out the other side. Or I've been through that thing and come out the other side. It's the ripple effect of that is immeasurable. So for anybody who thinks that their voice doesn't matter or that their voice shouldn't be heard, or it's what I hear all the time. People say, oh, Jack, can I, can I give you my story to read out in Parliament? Because I, I, don't, I, I don't want to be in the spotlight. I'm like, I don't want to be in the spotlight. Go and tell your own story in Parliament. Um, but, it's, but, but I do, because for some reason I have this platform, and I continue to have this platform, even though I'm absolutely terrible at it. And so I kind of say to people, just use me like a foghorn, really, to funnel your stories back to the people that can make a difference and the people who do make those decisions. And um, hopefully that... Hopefully that made a bit of sense, but hopefully that can also make some change somewhere along yeah. the way. Well, here's to foghorns everywhere, <laughs> reluctant or not. Thank you so much for your tenacity and Thank resilience. You. Campaigner of the Year, Jack Minogue. <laughs> That was our final award of the night. Thank you so much to you at home for joining us. We really appreciated having you here. It's lovely to see all your messages on social media, joining in the chat on Zoom. Don't forget to let us know what you're using to toast all the success of uh, these winners uh, tonight. Could be champagne, could be cup of tea. We don't mind here. Uh, we just want to see your pictures on social media. So keep the shout outs coming. Huge, huge congratulations to all of our amazing winners and runners up, of course. And you can find more about them on social media and on the website. Thank you again to all of our brilliant sponsors who made tonight possible to Tortoise for hosting us in their glorious slow newsroom, to Voitech for all the wonderful videos and technical wizardry, and to Brand Ethos, whose designs brought this year's awards to life. A very special thanks also to all the wonderful people who took part in our short films. Really hope you've enjoyed tonight as much as we all have in this room. I'd like to invite you to raise a glass right now. Uh, where's my glass? I'll get one in a minute or a mug to all the campaigners we've celebrated this evening. Do tweet and use other social media, whatever you can find. Let us know what you've loved. Let us know your favourite campaigns. Hashtag love campaigning, hashtag SMK Awards 2022. And whatever the future brings, please keep campaigning, keep the flame alive, and we will see you next year for the 2023 SMK National Campaigner Awards. Thank you.